voice, Jeremy Lord. Captain Dobbin, having retired from the South Seas in the dumb tides of, with a handful of shells, a few poison arrows, a cask of pearls, and 5,000 pounds in the colonial funds, now sails the street in a brick villa, Laburnum Villa, in whose blank windows the harbor hangs like a fog against the glass, golden and smoky, or stoned with a white glitter. And boats go by, suspended in the pane, blue funnel, red funnel, messageries maritimes. Lug down the port like sea beasts taken alive that scrape their bellies on sharp sands of which particulars Captain Dobbins keeps in a ledger sticky with ink. Entries of time and weather, state of the moon, nature of cargo and captain's name, for some mysterious and awful purpose, never divulged. For at night, when the stars mock themselves with lanterns, so late the chimes blow loud and faint, like a hand shutting and unshuttling over the bells, Captain Dobbin, having observed from bed the lights like a great fiery snake of the Comoran going to sea, will note the hour for subsequent recording in his gazette. But the sea is really closer to him than this, closer to him than a dead lovely woman, for he keeps bits of it like old letters, salt tied up in bundles or pressed flat what you might call a lock of the sea's hair, so Captain Dobbin keeps his dwarf memento, his urn burial, a chest of mummied waves, gales fixed in print, and the sweet, dangerous countries of shark and Kwaswarna tree, stolen and put in colored maps, like a flask of seawater or a bottled ship, a schooner caught in a glass bottle, but Captain Dobbin keeps them in books. Crags of varnished leather, pimply with guilt by learned mariners and masters of hydrostatics, or the childish tales of simple heroes taken by Turks or dropsy. So nightly he sails from shelf to shelf or to the quadrants, dangling with rusty screws, or the hanging gardens of old charts so old they bear the authentic protractor lines, traced in faint ink, as fine as Chinese hairs. Over the flat and painted atlas leaves, his reading glass would tremble. Over the fathoms, pricked in tiny rows, water shelving to the coast. Quietly the bone-rimmed lens would float till, through the glass, he felt the barbled rush of bubbles foaming, Spy the albacores, the bluefin admirals, heard the wind-swallowed cries of planters running on the beach, who filched their swags of yams and ambergris, birds' nests and sandalwood, from pastures numbed by the sun's yellow, too meek for honest theft. But he, less delicate robber, climbed the walls, broke into dozing houses, crammed with black bottles, marish wine, crusty and salt-corroded fading prints, sparkle-daubed almanacs and playing cards with a rusty cannon left by the French outside, half buried in sand. Even to the castle of Queen Pomeray, in the Yankees' footsteps, and found her throne room piled with golden candelabras, mildewed swords, Guitars and fouling pieces, tossed in heaps with greasy cakes and flung down calabashes. Then Captain Dobbin's eye, that eye wild in wispy scudding blue, voluptuously prying would light up like mica scratched by gully suns. And he would be fearful to look upon and shattering in his conversation. Nor would he tolerate the harmless chanty, no Shenandoah, or the dainty mew that landsmen offer in a silver dish to Neptune, sung to pianos in candlelight. Of these, he spoke in scorn, 
For there was but one way of singing Sturm along, he said, and that was not really singing, but howling rather, shrieked in the wind's jaws by furious men, not tinkled in drawing rooms, by lapdogs in clean shirts. And at these words, the galleries of photographs, men with rich beards, pea jackets and brass buttons, with folded arms, would scowl approval, for they were shipmates too, companions of no crews by reading glass, but fellows of storm and honey from the past. The Charlotte, Java, Knuckle and Fred at Port-au-Prince, William in his new rig, even that notorious scoundrel, Captain Baggs, who, as we all knew, owned Dobbin twenty pounds, lost that fair cribbage, but he never paid. Or paid with a slack of topless sheets, as Captain Dobbin frequently expressed it. There were their faces, grilled a trifle now, cigar-hued in various spots, by the brown breath of sodium-eating years on quarter decks long burnt to the water's edge, a resurrection of the dead by chemicals, and the voyages they had made. Their labors in a country of water, were they not marked by inadequate lines on charts tied up like skins in a rack? Or his own Odysseus, his lonely travels, his trading days, an autobiography of angles and triangles and lossages, ruled tack by tack, across the sheet that with a single scratch expressed the stars Morak and Alamac and Alpharat the wind, the moon, the sun the clambering sea sails bleached with light salt in the eyes bamboos and Tahiti oranges from some forgotten countless day one founder day from a forgotten month a year sucked quietly from the blood dead with the rest, remembered by no more than a scratch on a dry chart, or when the return grew too choking bittersweet, and laburnum berries manifestly tossed behind the window, not the fabulous leaves of hotu, or canoe tree, or palmetto. There were the wanderings of other keels, Magellan, Bougainville, and Cook, who found no greater memorial than footprints over a lithograph. For Cook he worshipped, that captain with the sad and fine white face who never lost a man or flinched a peril. And a Bourgainville, he spoke with graceful courtesy as a rival to whom the honors of the hunting field must be accorded. Not so with the Spaniard Sebastian Juan del Cano, at whom he sneered openly, calling him a fool of fortune blown to a sailor's abbey by chance winds and blindfold currents who slept in a fine cabin, blundered through five degrees of latitude, was bullied by mutineers a hundred more, and woke and found himself across the world, coldly in the window, like a fog rubbed up and down the glass, the harbor, bony with mist, and ropes of water glittered, and the blind tide that crawls it knows not where not for what gain, push its drowned shoulders against the wheel, against the wheel of the mill. Flowers rocked far down, and white dead bodies that were anchored there, in marshes of spent light. Blue funnel, red funnel, the ships went over them, and bells in engine rooms cried to the bowels of flaring oil, and stokers groaned and sweated like burnt skins, Clawed to their shovels, but quietly in his room, in his little cemetery of sweet essences, with fond memorial stones and lines of grace, Captain Dobbin went on reading about the sea.